Hi, everybody. I'm Mary Rowe from the Canadian Urban Institute. Um, boy, we are just having an action-packed three days here, working morning till night uh, in Victoria, hearing from all sorts of Victorians about issues that are so critically important, not only to you folks who are living here in Victoria, but to people across the country who live in urban environments. I'm so appreciative of the leadership that the mayor and the Victoria Foundation have taken in hosting us. Um, and as I say, all these hundreds of people that are coming on these sessions, this one is on inclusive economies, the people coming in across the country. This is the uh, uh, traditional um, territory of the Lenkwangan speaking peoples, the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations. And we've had really fabulous opportunities to hear from Indigenous communities and all, all sorts of diverse constituencies that are talking to us about colonialism, the impact of colonialism, but also the opportunities for new economic development, new kinds of forms of urban life. And uh, so it's really a, a great example of why CUI Local is so critical to us across the country to learn from one another about uh, what's working, what's not, and what's next. So we appreciate the program. We appreciate everybody coming in, coping with technology, coping with uh, tight schedules, uh, and also um, very appreciative that we're here in a space sharing it actually with the Victoria Foundation and the mayor. So I'm gonna pass to the mayor um, who will provide some background for this session and the context. And then we're gonna have a tre tremendous uh, sharing of viewpoints and perspectives. So thanks for joining us. Thank you, Mary. I believe we're going to Sandy Richardson first, uh, the CEO of the Victoria Foundation. If I'm wrong, someone tell me, but I think is Sandy's up next. All right, Sandy, over Great. to you, and then we're coming to me. Great. Well, good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of the board and staff of the Victoria Foundation, I just wanted to say thank you to all of you for joining us here today. And I'd like to acknowledge, too, that our foundation offices are located on the uh, traditional territorial lands of the Lagwangan speaking people of the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. Hosted uh, by the Victoria Foundation, vital conversations like this one that we're about to have today really amplify the voices in our community and bring important data from the annual vital science program to life. And for the past few years, we've had the honor of partnering with Coast Capital to bring us these conversations. And I'd like to just say thank you to the entire Coast Capital team, and particularly to Tanya Smith for your leadership in this work. Uh, we value these partnerships and we're excited about where our discussion is going to take us today. And over the years, we've explored issues such as financial well-being and youth mental health, going beyond the numbers to elevate the voices of those with lived experience. This year's vital conversation will focus on, <clears throat> pardon me, developing a shared vision for a more inclusive economy, which I think is more relevant than ever before. Our theme for the 2021 Vital Science Report is equity and inclusion. Our survey results and our secondary data show that while there is many, many positives in our community, there's also a lot of work still to be done, especially in coming to terms with creating a more equitable society. We have an engaging panel discussion for you today followed by a visioning exercise that will help us explore what is possible in our community. And to start this important conversation, I'd like to introduce uh, Mayor Lisa Helps, who will be our panel moderator for this afternoon. Mayor Helps has been a vocal advocate for inclusive economies in our region, and we are grateful for the united passion that she shares along with the Victoria Foundation to create a vibrant and caring community for all residents in our region. So Mayor Helps, we're just so delighted that you're taking part in this today and thank you for joining us. And it's now over to you. 
Thank you so much, Sandy. It is an honor to be here with you as always uh, with CUI, uh, with the Victoria Foundation. And I also, uh, we're all downtown at the Victoria Conference Centre today, uh, some of us from the city and Victoria Foundation and uh, CUI, and we are also on the Kwangan territory the homelands of the song he's in Esquimalt nations and um, many of us got to go for a uh, a walk uh, a Lekwungen walking tour on um uh, Sunday afternoon, boy, it feels like uh, two weeks ago now, but with uh, Mark Albany and those walking tours have been open to members of the public as part of this. And, and we learned a lot about the song He's in Esquimalt Economies pre-contact, and they were inherently inclusive economies. They included each other. They included uh, even the settlers. They included uh, the clams and the crabs. And, uh, and so I think there's a lot to, as we go forward looking at inclusive economies, a lot that we can learn from the people uh, of these lands. We're gonna to ground today's conversation in the recently released Vital Signs report. And I'm just going to give a few data points from the Vital Signs to frame the conversation. And then I am going to invite three wonderful uh, women uh, who are working in inclusive economies to, to join me on the panel. And then as Sandy said, there'll be a bit of a visioning exercise uh, afterwards. So um, just going to the vital signs, uh, you know, as Sandy said, there's a lot in there that's going well, but there's a lot that's not going well. And, and I think there's room to build more inclusive economies. So fully 64% of people who took the vital signs survey uh, reported that their perception, perceptions of the economy were average, below average or poor. So that means the majority of people in our region don't have a positive perception of their place in the economy. Interestingly, respondents who recorded an annual income over $80,000 per year were more likely to rate the economy as excellent or good. So just that data point alone shows that there's a disparity. There's a disparity in reality, a disparity in perception, and uh, a lot of work to do. In terms of standard of living, uh, and this is on page 31 of the vital signs for those of you who want to go look at it in a bit more detail, um, the median census family income after tax in 2018 was higher in Greater Victoria uh, than Canada, which was 53,440, British Columbia 53,480, and Greater Victoria 57,550. So we're doing kind of comparatively okay if you look at the median income, but then if you look at other parts of the vital signs, you'll see that the cost of living in this region is much more substantial than it is in some of the other parts of British Columbia or even Canada. And then finally, standard of living. Um, there's a really interesting equity snapshot, uh, again on page 31. In 2019, over 50% of BC women were employed in sectors most affected by public health measures put in place to limit the spread of COVID. And this in includes uh, healthcare, retail, education, accommodation, and food services. Um, all of these uh, occupations obviously had high levels of interaction and exposure, risk of exposure to the virus. Um, concentration of women in these employment sectors led to BC women losing 60% more jobs, 60% more jobs in March, 2020, the first month of the pandemic than men in BC. And the effective unemployment rate of women in the province as of March, 2020 was 26.5%. So more than a quarter of women in British Columbia lost their jobs just like that. And what that means, because of the pandemic. And what that means is we don't have an inclusive economy and we don't have a resilient economy. So uh, we do have three experts today who are uh, working on building inclusive and resilient economies. And I'd now like to uh, turn to all of them and invite them to, to join me. Um, I'm not gonna read their bios, but the CUI folks are gonna put them into the chat. And so if we could get the view set up to have me and all the panelists together, uh, that would be great. Okay, Jamie's multitasking. Uh, that's all right, we'll start, uh, but if we can get all the panelists up at a certain point, that would be awesome because all I can see is a big screen of myself and I am not the main event. Oh, there's Sandy as the main event and hopefully we'll get uh, everyone else. So um, while, I'm, while we're getting the panelists up here, uh, I would like to ask all three of you, um, Narinder and Christina and Ruth, um, what are the top three characteristics that are important in building an inclusive economy? And as the panelists are providing their answers to all of us here in the audience, uh, let's think about this because some of this is gonna be used in the visioning exercise for the second part of the conversation. So I don't know who would like to go first to answer that question, the top three characteristics uh, to building an inclusive economy. Christina here. Christina, I'll go to you. Well, thank you. 
I think it's really important to have one characteristic be understanding. The stakeholders in the economy is the people in the economy, all of us, and we need to understand one another to be able to work together. We need to be aware of one another's challenges, needs, goals, and priorities. Yeah. We need to talk to one another. We need to share our stories with one another and to celebrate one another. <clears throat> that, that, that understanding will lead to better decision-making and more inclusive decision-making. Secondly, an inclusive economy needs connective tissue. I, I like to think of the, the economy as an ecosystem and when it's thriving, it's, it's all its parts are working together. We need institutional and social mechanisms that connect people so that ideas and opportunities can, can be shared and we can find connections and we can tap into all of the innovation and talent that is, is out there and, and many of it we're not, we're not hearing about, they're not at the table. The third thing would be equitable government policy. Public policy needs to, to promote collaboration rather than competition for limited resources. Uh, we need to have support for what's working locally. An example of this would be that for Indigenous programming, it's um, decisions are made by the federal government in Ottawa about uh, how money should be spent here in the coast. We really need them to be paying attention to what we're doing right here in Greater Victoria and the partnerships that we're doing with businesses here. And the, the legislation and the supportive funding should take that into account so that we are able to um, be on equal footing as we work to collaborate together. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. And now we can see all of your wonderful faces. Uh, before I go, I'll go to Ruth and then Narinder to answer the question next. I just want to uh, remind everyone that if you need closed captioning for this session, uh, if you press CC at the bottom, it will give you that. Uh, and also you probably all know, because you can see that uh, the session is being recorded. Uh, so it will be uh, saved for posterity up on the CUI website, but the closed captioning, uh, we forgot to mention that at the beginning. Uh, apologies, and we are doing it now. So Ruth, what are three characteristics uh, for an inclusive economy. Absolutely, I and I was just gonna pick on some of the things that uh, Christina just shared, cause I had them on my list as well. But I think I'll just start with accountability. Um, I, the work that we do at the Inclusion Project and how we operate and work with uh, different stakeholders, uh, we think it's really high time we start we start to shift from uh, lip service to you know the need for inclusion and what exactly that looks like to so having clear cut accountability metrics. Um, that are scorecards that could be in the form of scorecards or different uh, measures that clearly uh, let us know we're tracking the progress. It really clearly tells us the story of how we're progressing um, as a group, as an organization, as communities uh, working together. And of course, that has to do with transparency. Uh, part of that is us being, you know, being very open. Uh, to what Christina was saying about the need to share understanding uh, for power holders, whether as employers or policymakers or people in governance, uh, there's a need, there's a need for more openness and for us to have uh, clear measures that we can we can uh, guide our processes and systems by. Uh, the other part, very much like what Christina was saying too, is around uh, participation and representation. I like to say that very few things are as disempowering as walking into a room as a racial person, as a woman, as whomever, and not seeing people whose experiences mirror yours, or not speaking, seeing anyone who speaks a language or has an accent um, close to, to, to yours. Um, so the need for more participation, um, there are people, look at whatever community, look at uh, institutions, and you see people who are motivated to, to, to contribute. Uh, we need to ensure that th there are opportunities for them to participate meaningfully. And then the last bit is around equity, um, equitable and, uh, and stable. Um, uh, Mayor, you were, you were just talking about uh, some of the data around uh, the impact of, of the pandemic on women. We've been talking about the she session and now more so we're talking about the great uh, resignation. Who are the people who are having to resign? Where are they having to go to? What are some of the reasons? Some of this have to do with mental health. It's, it's become about the burden that, of expectations um, around your caregiving roles and things like that. Um, having clear measures, having clear conditions uh, in the context of work uh, that, that meets the needs of this, the peculiar unique needs of particular groups, um, I think would uh, just make the, the economy all the more inclusive for all of us. Thank you so much. I'm taking copious notes. Uh, Narinder, I'm going to turn to you. Three characteristics of building an inclusive economy. 
I'm going to build on what Christina was saying and Ruth um, um, shared as well. So uh, this first concept for me is really important is a view of a binary mindset. And I, I think we see this in Canada and I, we definitely see this in the social sector, but I even think as Canadians, we are good people doing good work. And so when we're thinking about kind of where we position ourselves, we're good people, not bad people. So that means as good people, we're not sexist, we're not racist, we don't have, you know, we don't hold bias. And, and within this mindset, which again, very common across Canada, um, in particular in the social sector, uh, we're, we're really missing our opportunity to be better. And there is this phenomenal social psychologist, Do Dr. Dolly Chung uh, from New York, who, who talks about this. And she also indicates that a way to solve for this is to take a, a good-ish framework. So we are all good-ish. And so then we could acknowledge that regardless of who we are, regardless of our demographics, our class, or any of that, we're all on a growth journey myself i'm on a growth journey to understand how i can be more inclusive how my practice can practices can be more inclusive so that's kind of the first piece i think we need to start to shift off of that binary mindset that we often find ourselves in uh, the second piece this kind of touches on the accountability part that ruth was mentioning is really understanding our current baseline we don't collect a lot of disaggregated data. We don't share data. Government holds a tremendous amount of data. That doesn't necessarily talk to itself in different levels and different departments. Um, the nonprofit sector holds a set of data. The for-profit sector holds a set of data. SAPS Canada holds an extremely important set of data. And, and so for us to truly make progress on who are the decision makers of capital or who are the leaders within our institutions, we need to actually understand where we are today so we can start making meaningful progress for change. Um, and the third piece I think is really critical is, is listening and including the right voices in the decision making. And, and the stat that sticks out to me is that um, from the Vital Signs Report, uh, if you make more than $80,000 a year, you're more likely to feel like things are okay. And then when you start to break that down and say, who are making the decisions of the way we operate? And they are often making more than $80,000 a year. Sorry, I think I might have said a day, I meant a year, <laughs> but uh, a year. So if the folks that are making the decisions that determine how our ec economies operate think that things are okay, then that's the type of incremental changes we're going to see in policies or in deployment of capital. You know, you know, I think of, you know, one example in particular, when you looked at um, government supports during the pandemic, people on disability supports, on provincial disability supports, did not get any additional capital from the government, whereas a, a Canadian not on disability support, but was out of a job, was receiving $2,000 per month people on disability support ranged anywhere from averaging 700 to 12, 1200. And so, you know, again, who are the folks that are making the decisions? The same would apply to paid sick leave. You know, folks in power don't have an issue of paid sick leave. So the listening piece, I think, is really critical if we want to truly build um, a more inclusive society. Thank you so much to all of you. And I, and Arinder, I love how you ended that, a more inclusive society. And of course, uh, an economy is the foundation of society. And so as we build more inclusive economies, we're building more inclusive society. So thank you all uh, for, for sharing those three top elements. And again, uh, for those participating, we're gonna come back to some of those concepts a little bit later on. Uh, now I'm gonna go into a specific questions that I have for each of you. And Ruth, it's interesting. The question for you actually builds on exactly what Narinder just said, which is whose voices are missing. Um, so participation of people in uh, economic institutions is critical. And as uh, all of you have just outlined, some voices are missing. So as part of creating more inclusive economies, whose voices do we need to include uh, that are currently missing? And importantly, what are the barriers for their participation? And how can we begin to remove those barriers and, and reimagine what participation can look like? Because if it's the people making $80,000 a year that are making the decisions and they think everything is fine, as Narinder says, we're stuck, nothing's gonna change. So what are the barriers to participation? Whose voices are missing? And how do we take down those barriers? Mm -hmm. You know, um, something that Narinder was just saying, just around uh, the, the need to shift our focus from the 
very binary perspective that we tend to bring to this to a more intersectional approach to it. I think first it begins with, for us to look at who's missing at what tables, we need to first see whose experiences are being mirrored. Um, and again, to what Narinda was saying, uh, we need to ensure that for people making policies, uh, policy, inclusive policy making as it relates to the economy is not something that creates space for people after the fact. Um, the thinking, the envisioning and everything that goes into it has to be hands on uh, for the people who themselves are impacted. Otherwise, we, we will continue to only see um, how side um, of any story. You only put this on the air dryer or just in the, in the washing machine? Uh -oh. just, the just, the <laughs> just want to remind everyone to go on mute. We're hearing about people's uh, laundry, which is definitely women's work. Uh, absolutely <laughs> is. But uh, just a reminder to people to mute. Uh, sorry about that, Ruth. Go ahead. No, it, shouldn't be. it shouldn't be women's work, might I say, but uh, traditionally gendered <laughs> female. All right, Ruth, sorry for the interruption. Please go ahead. Not at all. Um, just, just emphasizing the need for intersectionality. And part of that is ensuring that we're creating spaces where people can define themselves as they are, present as they, as they are, tell their own stories and not put them within systems and structures uh, where they are confined to, to just, um, to, to have to resonate uh, with, you know, the predominant um, narrative. Um, and as part of that too is um, shifting shifting our sense of or the perception of um whose responsibility uh this is uh to to do the change uh within the community that i represent uh we talk about the black tax um and part of that is you know the expectation that as the one black person in the room as the one indigenous person in the room as the one just fill in the blank with any equity deserving group. Um, you're the one who can tell the stories um, of everyone that you represent. Uh, you're the one who can who can really bring those stories to, to the forefront. And just the need for us to shift that and create spaces that are inclusive in terms of ensuring that um, whoever the leaders are, power holders are, um, at whatever level within the organization, they see themselves as part of the solution as well. And I'll give an example just around um, employment and how often we've made the uh, the responsibility for employment equity um, just a, an HR prerogative. And what we're saying is the responsibility uh, for, for truly inclusive workplaces begins with a person at the front desk. Um, it ends with the person at the top, the CEO, who maybe might not be as connected to the lived experiences, the lived realities of the people on the ground who uh, for a number of reasons are not able to access those opportunities. All I'm saying is there's got to be more collaboration across the board. Um, there's got to be more um, each and every one of us finding a space um, for us to contribute to, to shifting the 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 divide um as well i i was talking about paying lip service earlier um uh, so uh, the killing of george floyd and everything that that resulted into with the black lives matter movement and everything uh one of the things that we started to notice really on really early on was organizations coming forward and saying hey we want to do something about this we want to um, have a diversity statement and we want to do something that is more performative than anything else. And we were saying, first, you've got to take a step back. You need to assess, you need to evaluate, because if we don't recognize, if we don't first seek to recognize where the gaps are, or to borrow from what Christina was saying earlier, first seek to understand where are we, what is the racial climate, what is filling the blank space, um, the gender um, climate within this organization, we won't know where we need to go to. And that's going back to that bit too on measuring uh, the need for us to first take stock and know what we need to measure. And then from that to develop clear goals, clear object, uh, clear really objective roadmaps as well that helps us get to where we need to go to. Um, and in terms of some of the barriers that um, that racialized people, I would speak for, to that, uh, that racialized people are facing in the context of work, particularly around uh, newcomers to Canada. Uh, we're, we're talking about um, issues like, you know, just the general lack of representation. So if you walk into, into um, an interview and nobody uh, within that space has done some work to educate themselves of what it means to, to bring on 
an indigenous person to this workplace or what it means to have someone who's racialized possibly uh, the only racialized person in the room. Uh, what we find is often those contexts, even when you do have some some success, some form of success, uh, in the long run, they are not sustainable. And also, I was talking about the black tax earlier. You find a lot of racialized people having to pay that tax, um, having to be the ones to do the work on behalf of their colleagues within uh, whatever workplace it is. So um, to, to move from where we're at to where we need to get to, uh, this needs to be a strategic priority uh, for everyone, not just leadership and not just people at the front lines as well. There's got to be trackable goals and clear my, milestones. Uh, we need to develop uh, roadmaps that help us get to where we need to get to. And of course, we need to uh, create spaces where there is value for the lived experiences, uh, the diverse skills and capacities uh, that people bring to, to, to the workplace as well. Thank you, Ruth. You've given us a heck of a lot to think about. Uh, I'm now going to turn to Christina. And again, when you're thinking about and when we're thinking about inclusive economies, if we were to rethink, because uh, part of inclusive economies is rethinking the economy. So if we were to rethink economic and financial well-being, what would it look like? Is it a broader notion of well-being, a narrower version? How do we think about well-being if we're building inclusive economies? Thank you. That is a great question. And listening to my colleagues here, it gets me all excited and my mind going in a million directions and I've got all these notes in front of me and I want to synthesize it into something meaningful for you. I think I, I want to be philosophical for a second and possibly sound um, incredibly naive, but I, these are truths. And I think sometimes um, solid truths sound just too simple to be, to be real. Uh, I think that well-being is at, at the individual level, the family level, the community level, the nation level, the world, it's, it's, it's really all, all the same thing. We're talking about, and it should always look at it from a, a holistic perspective, the, the, the health of the whole. You can't um, poison a river and expect the lake that it pours into to be safe to drink. We're all connected, the systems are all connected and, it's, and we're realizing um, in our generation more than ever, those of us alive at this time, the impact of not thinking of ourselves as a holistic whole. So we're having to rethink our economy in ways that can be sustained, and in ways that can address some of the things which take away from our well-being, uh, injustice, for example. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I want to say about economic well-being, the economy is how we engage in the world. It's what we do to, to live. It's who we are, really. It's like, you know, how we earn earn our wage and too many people are doing that during the week just to get to the weekend and and they hate their job and and they're they're just churning it out in the hopes that they'll get a few years of retirement that is not sustainable and and we have an epidemic of, of mental health right now with with COVID and part of the reason is that we, we're realizing that the system is not sustainable so I want to give a couple of examples of these kind of values and principles in action one of them would be Songhees Nation. I work for the Songhees Development Corporation and previously um, for the nation itself. And my most recent role with them was, is as executive director. And I had the honor of working with them on the development of a 10 year strategic plan. And that plan identified six goals, health, education and employment, land and housing, self-determination, economic development and language and culture. What we learned when we were doing that is that each one of those things is interconnected. And when you're, when you're, when you're, the economy you're building is, is a community where you know everybody and every, they're literally members of a family. It's really easy to think about all the, the well being of all of the members of the whole when you're serving them, especially when the organization that you're part of has health services and education services. And so we, we can pull some of the levers ourselves if we have cooperation from the funders to try to resolve the, the issues that we have. So economic development becomes a means to provide the resources that we can that to improve health outcomes, for example. And economic development can be a way that we express language and culture and, and, and how the Lekwungen people are, are um, represented in their territory. We can use economic development to do that. So as we develop our business plans and a strategic plan for our economic development unit, we're always looking at the health, at the education, at the land, 
everything that we do in economic development needs to meet those, those objectives. We would never take on a business that would harm the environment when one of our priorities is to protect the environment. And we, we, we certainly could not hire people and, and, and pay them poverty wages while we're trying to improve their lives. So we, every business that we start is a social enterprise. And I really think all business should be a social enterprise because business doesn't just exist to create money, it exists to support society, to support the people. So watching Songhees develop its, its, you know, its economy and integrating into the larger economy is watching the nation emerge in its full nationhood. Um, and it's a wonderful thing to witness. And so all those are sort of lofty principles I'm talking about, they can be very real and we can witness them taking place right in front of us. And we can, we can model that in other areas. The second example would be the Indigenous Prosperity Center. And this speaks to actually all three of the characteristics I spoke of earlier, understanding, connectedness and, and policy. So we realized through the work in the Rising Economy Task Force with the South Island Prosperity Partnership, and we had an, an Indigenous Economy Committee as part of that. <clears throat> and what came out of that was were a recognition that some of the things we're talking about today, there isn't connective tissue. Even the nations don't necessarily understand what the other nations are doing, what the priorities are, and, and, and the neighboring communities don't necessarily know what the priorities are. Uh, we, we don't know one another in many cases. Um, so we need to get again an understanding among nations, between the nations and the educational institutions and the, and the financial institutions and industry and local government. Everybody needs to understand everybody else better so that we can see where we can help one another. And uh, it also speaks to the connections. The Indigenous Prosperity Centre could be a navigator hub. It could be a way to access um, First Nations who are interested in doing collaborative projects. So somewhere that where industry could go, where local government could go, where the nations themselves could go, where an, an Indigenous entrepreneur could go to get connected to other people and to create projects together, to, to work on uh, accessing procurement opportunities together, finding training efficiencies, and um, raising the profile of Indigenous economic development to the region, so helping with that integration. And it also speaks to policy because that, as we work to, to bring that into creation, we're working with the leadership of the nations um, and we're asking them to co-create with us what this will be. Uh, and it'll evolve over time, it's exactly what it will be. Um, but it, it um, we will be able to speak with a stronger voice when we all speak together about what we need. It'll, it'll help government make wise decisions when we're able to say this, these are the common threads of what the First Nation communities on the South Island need. And here's what you could do to make it easier for us to work with our partners in the region here. All, too many times the barrier for us to participate is in Ottawa. And, and, it, and that needs to change. Our, our, we need to have self-determination right here in Greater Victoria. So I, ultimately, I believe when you, when you have well-being, um, you can unlock human potential. And we, we have people that are suffering an addiction that are um, and trauma that could be brilliant minds. And, and we, need to, we need to bring those people home into our family. And when we take care of everyone in the family, then we can bring the gifts out of each and every person. Everybody has gifts to bring. And if your body doesn't work and your mind is working, is anybody listening to the brilliance that people have? So that's really important. And the, um, I think that some of the pressures of this shifting economy are actually causing some of those good things to happen. And I'm really pleased to see them. Um, for example, we're needing to pay higher wages in order to retain people. And I think I, I heard the saying, if you can't afford to pay a living wage, you don't have a viable business model. And I think we have to rethink our business models. So we shouldn't be sacrificing the well-being of any of our employees to generate wealth for a few. That that makes zero sense. So the um, yeah, the, the shorter work week, flexibility with families, and understanding that you're more than just your job. You might want to have a, a life outside of that, and, and supporting that and allowing space for that. These uh, the labor force pressures are are creating some of that. You know, I, I have a friend who has a job that he does not enjoy, but he wants to be an entrepreneur, and he can't. He's struggling financially to let go of the job that he can't that he doesn't enjoy to live his dream. Well, if 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 we had a more um, 
equitable system, there'd be opportunities for him to say work part time and grow a business. You know, we need an environment that can help people transition like this, this great resignation that we're seeing. It's it it's took great sacrifice for that to happen. But maybe we can find ways to create more of that for people so people can transition from jobs they hate to jobs they love and uh, and that that will mean a brighter future for all of us. Thank you. Thanks so much, Christina. Just a couple of reflections before I go to Narinder. Uh, it's really interesting that you, you, the way that the Indigenous Prosperity Centre is being created is exactly what Ruth recommended, which is engage people at the policy stage at the very beginning. So we, I think the Indigenous Prosperity Centre is uh, well set for success because it's making those good, uh, those good decisions at the outset um, by and for the nation. So I thought, Ruth, that was a really interesting insight that you shared that if the policymakers uh, aren't people with lived experience of the issue that's trying to be solved, but it's not going to be the right policy. So just wanted to weave those two things together. Uh, and also, Christina, I, I wrote down and then circled in green, all businesses should be social enterprises. Prizes. And maybe that is what an inclusive economy means. Maybe that's where we're going. Uh, and, and also this notion that if you can't pay a living wage, you don't have a viable business, uh, business plan. So, I mean, those are two really concrete things that we can measure and implement uh, pretty, pretty quickly. So thanks for sharing that. I'm going to turn to Narinder now and ask her to talk about power, because we've talked about policy, we've talked about concrete examples of creating an inclusive economy with Songhees and the Indigenous Prosperity Centre. So Narinder, how do we think about power and how do we begin to explore the power, explore and or implement uh, the power shifts necessary to create a truly inclusive economy? It's a big question, uh, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to hand it your way. It, it is. And alongside a few partners, uh, Coast Capital, Community Foundations of Canada, Duke uh, Credit Union, and OTF, we've been working on this specifically around how capital flows through our work with New Power Labs. And, and it's important. We don't often talk about or... Narendra, really... you're muted. Oh, can you hear me? Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, we can hear her. Okay. Mary, it's Mary. Sorry. <laughs> Excuse the interruption from our colleague. No worries, in no um, so, so we often don't really understand who holds power or map who holds power, but that is some of the most critical work that needs to be done. Because at the end of the day, if you want to truly change something, you need to change the power structures within institutions and within the way decisions are made. Um, you know, I often reflect around a lot of uh, DEI or diversity, equity, inclusion work that happens actually doesn't touch any power structures. It's done around, right? It's done like, you know, that young person um, that probably a person of color, you can start to work on this project or, um, you know, gender work is done um, not within the decision making framework, but in in and around that. And so really the first uh, step into changing power and is to understand who holds power and to have a better common view of that. So then when we are designing uh, updates to policies or processes or, or other um, uh, actions that can support change, we're addressing the right parts of the institution to drive that change. And, you know, we, we talk a lot about who is making the decisions and that again, critical part of, of power. And so there's this, there's this image I love. It talks, it's an image I was floating around last year when we were talking about equity and, and, and diversity. And it talks, it has these four images of investment bankers. Um, the first is a white man. Um, the second is a black man. The third is a white woman. And the fourth is an Asian man. And, you know, the investment banking, um, uh, the investment bank is applauding the diversity and the, the, the they have a bunch of um, common features. And the one that stands out is their parents all own multiple yachts. So, you know, yeah, OK, on, on the surface, there's diversity there. But are you actually changing anything? Because there's no class diversity and class diversity is one of the biggest drivers, I believe, to word change. And so. There's, there's more to the conversation about equity than just a physical or kind of one layer. You know, the new CEO of Citibank is a woman. Now, does that mean that Citibank today is more inclusive to women and to gender access? I don't know, and I don't actually think so. So it, it is it matters more. So I think we need to start thinking of this at a more holistic way of how we start to, to shift systems. Um, 
you know, what we're seeing is some really interesting approaches to shifting power, um, in particular in philanthropy, you have participatory grant making, um, you have a huge amount of organizations trying to think through who uh, are the decision makers, how you include community in decision making. Um, we are looking um, at, there's a really great project out in Boston called Ujima Project, and, and there's other projects similar like Village Capital or even Shio has a similar model is where you actually let the entrepreneurs make the decision on who will get funded. So you're, you're giving control um, to the community versus going through a traditional investment process, investment committee process. Uh, but, but there's a lot of changes that we need to make to actually start to shift this power and then recognize that there is bias in our decision making. You know, the, you know, if you take a look at um, entrepreneurship, Christina mentioned about, you know, um, uh, one, you know, somebody who wants to move out of entrepreneurship, but can only do it part time in our current structure again, of, of who gets access to venture capital or, or financing, actually being a part-time entrepreneur is often a detriment. So we need to reframe what is possible and be more inclusive of different ways of working and different ways of approaching, uh, whether it's entrepreneurship or other types of kind of economic development activities. So we can start to build, um, again, more inclusive capital flows and then ultimately, I think, greater economic development. Thanks very much, Narendra. That's really interesting how you started off the question, answering the question about power by answering the question about capital. And I think that that's, that's bang on. That the people who hold capital hold power and people who hold decision-making authority hold power. And it's it's both of those that, that need to be shifted. And I think also your, your observation that representation, uh, Ruth said, and I agree, representation is important, but representation isn't enough uh, to, to systemically begin to dismantle some of the economic, uh, economic system as it exists and, and make everything every business a social enterprise paying a living wage. Um, that is the end of the questions I have. Uh, Ruth had sent me a message asking, could everyone have a few moments to do a, I'm gonna be totally transparent because I think it's great, uh, you know, assert your voice. Uh, could everyone have a, a few moments, uh, a minutes just to do some wrap up comments. We're gonna move into the visioning exercise in just a moment, but um, I wanna offer each of you uh, wonderful women um, an opportunity to reflect on what you've heard, not just be driven by the questions that I'm uh, throwing your way. So uh, I'll go to Ruth and then invite Christina and then Narendra, just some wrap up comments uh, and, and things you'd like people to think about as we move into the visioning exercise. Thank you so much, Maya Lisa. Uh, I just wanted to regurgitate some of the thoughts that were already uh, circulated. Uh, first thing, equity is not about over asking. Um, there is a measure of asking, especially from racialized people, from equity uh, deserving groups. Um, there is a measure of asking that's okay. And then we've got to get to a point where, again, we need to do that stock taking of what's our responsibility here and what's been said already about redistributing power, redistributing resources as well. As long as we're not bringing resources to the table um, to support uh, people to do work that is meaningful and equitable to them and the communities that they serve, we're just perpetuating the same cycles of inequities. That's got to shift. Also, um, just the need to, something that's been said already about uh, the need to step out of our silos. Um, the, the, whether it's um, on the charitable sector front or any of the other sectors that we're talking about uh, on the public front as well, what I'm finding is everyone has questions, but they're just not talking to one another. I'm thinking of how the inclusion project started. It really was about asking questions. Mayor Lisa, you remember some of those really early questions that, you know, in your office we had those questions, but also can't, can't talk about the story of the inclusion project uh, without some of the initial conversations that we had at the Victoria foundation to around these questions around what's the place uh, for someone from my community or people like myself um, in contributing here. All I'm saying here is it's not just one person, uh, one group of organizations going through these issues. Uh, there's got to be, there's a huge need for us to create networks of change 
clusters of change and each and every one of us have a place um, in there. The last thing that I'll touch on in the is the need to look at the containers within which were contained as well. While um, this is kind of my clarion call to organizations to, to step up, to power holders to step up, there's a place for you here, uh, wh whether working from your own place of lived experience or from your allied experience, the grounded expertise that we can uh, build together, but also understanding and recognizing some of the constraints um, that organizations, institutions, have to work within. Um, and I guess what I'm saying here is um, there's got to be some concerted efforts from all of us as well to shake the past structures as they currently exist um, for us to, to, to have a cloud of sorts um, of voices coming together and saying, hey, uh, for us to do work that is truly meaningful, equitable and inclusive, some changes need to happen within our systems. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ruth. Brilliant, uh, brilliant thoughts to leave us with. Christina. Uh, yes, thank you. And, I, and at the risk of, of I think I'm, I'm an eternal optimist, but I, the, this work that is a huge challenge that we're dealing with. But we, it took us several hundred years to, to build this construct that we realized is, was a bad idea and we're trying to change it now. Um, but I, I see it actually happening. And I think with COVID is the the great amplifier both it amplified both the challenges and the opportunities somebody said the other day that change that was predicted to take 10 years is taking one month like we, with the and i think what i want to leave folks with is think about the the opportunity for change is dramatic right now i mean now is the time to shake those uh, roots of power. I mean, now is the time to to get in there and and make change. And in my experience, dealing with um, organizations and their efforts to engage with on a, for on a reconciliation basis with Songhees Nation, in my experience, when I'm working with, with bureaucrats, with industry leaders, with people in the education field, um, elderly people that are just interested, all of those people, what I'm seeing is each and every one of them undertaking their own reconciliation, starting with looking within and saying, what did I understand about this story of, of, of Canada and, and how we, our history with Indigenous people in Canada and re-investigating that, um, opening that wound up and looking at it again. Um, it has created a tremendous opportunity for us to reflect on what it means to be Canadian and what, what we would like to see Canada be. And I feel more so than ever, we can take this opportunity that we have right now to channel all that energy and all that um, this moment in time when change is possible and just just take leapfrogs ahead and I just think I'm just cheer on what everybody is doing the projects that you're each working on is uh, so important and and so well timed right now to to shift things people that weren't listening before are listening now and um, I, I have great hope for the future thank you Thank you, Christina. What a wonderful way to leave us. Uh, Narinder. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think that like we're in such a unique opportunity that we can have conversations that we couldn't have two years ago. And so that is really, that is enabling change. Um, there, was a, there was an awareness um, kind of during COVID about the inequalities that exist and how they were amplified, which is um, much more in the broader public <laughs> mind today than it ever has been so you know when you think about being primed for change we're there um now we just need to be intentional like mm -hmm. yeah you know if i look at capital venture capital went down for women in 2020 uh, in 2020 right so when i think about uh, like we, we you talked about how women um um ha have had greater struggles to this I think we now know, but now we need to act. We need to move out of, I think sometimes we, we have a hat of being a bystander, of not realizing that we can act and we can change regardless of what role we're in. We can highlight opportunities. Um, we can be entrepreneurs in our own companies or you know, in the city and the government and in our places of work to truly start to shift um, the way systems are, are run. And we all have our unique set of insight that will ultimately come together to topple the current model, which we know is not inclusive. 
Thank you, thank you all very much. This has been really, uh, really helpful and really enlightening. And I can say uh, here, this is the second last event of a three day series. I think we've got 15 or 16 events. And this has been a thread that has been woven through from the moment we started actually with our walking tour with Mark on Sunday. Uh, we The whole uh, day Monday was spent on uh, Lekwungen learning, uh, indigenous economics, um, really kind of diving into what does it mean to be Canadian? How do we rethink Canada? Uh, looking at Canada under review and so, this is, as we're coming to the close, a really kind of perfect way for all three of you to, to give us uh, your insights that um, change is already happening. Uh, the time is ripe. And, and every single conversation that we've had at CUI Victoria has been from voices of people with lived experience, people of color, Indigenous people, youth. They are all saying that too. The, the old world order is coming down. And now we are kind of putting it back together in a completely different way. So thank you for uh, unwittingly and unknowingly but really kind of carrying on uh, with, with uh, a lot of what we've heard here today, uh, sorry, this week from, from so many people. And, and also just thank you all for your courage and your power uh, in, your own, in your own work. It's, it's coming through uh, the screen very clearly as is your kind of heart-centered approach to, to your work. So thank you so much. Uh, really honored to have you spend uh, some time with us this afternoon. So with that, big breath transition. And we're going to hand it over to Jessica Dahl at the Victoria Foundation to uh, walk us all through a visioning exercise for the rest of the time. Uh, Jessica, over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mayor Helps. And um, gosh, yeah, that power and heart-centered work. You can uh, really feel that. I felt like I had goosebumps five or six times over the course of listening to you all. It's um, you're do, doing such inspiring work and um, I think these words are leaving us feeling a little bit hopeful and um, a little bit excited about the, the big exciting work that's in front of us. So thank you, um, Mayor Helps and all of the panelists for joining us today. So the next piece of this is really um, a bit of time to start to sink into what is hopeful for us moving into the future. Uh, Christina spoke so beautifully about this opportunity in front of us to really channel the energy and that um, we're in such a moment of time that we are ready for the shift and people are ready to, to talk about what this shift looks like. And so we're going to move ourselves into a bit of a visioning exercise as a group. Uh, and we're really going to explore the question, how can we build more inclusive economies in Victoria? So I am going to pass this off to Mary Rowe, who, who's kicked us off uh, earlier this afternoon to run us through the exercise. And um, I just invite you all to keep really uh, open hearts, open minds. And um, if there's questions that you may have, or you've got comments, don't be afraid to drop that into the chat box. If you're, um, if you're um, not finding space to uh, add your voice in and uh, over to you, Mary. Thanks, Jessica. I'm delighted to be able to have a chance to say hi to some of my old pals. Narendra, nice to see you and uh, uh, from your previous lives. And Christina, I love the social, uh, all, all business should be social business. I've heard that before too, through our work together at uh, Shorefast. And Ruth, nice to always be in company with you and for the comments, the thoughtful comments you made, particularly at the end there, uh, just uh, grounding this conversation in the real, which is important. And as the mayor just said, we're at the end, almost at the end of our third day here. And uh, there has been a kind of resonant theme, I would say, through the whole time. I also want to just say, uh, that in terms of the kind of composition of the conversations we're having, Mark and Jonathan, I'm glad to have you come on because I will say that cis women tend to, to have been front and center on almost every session we have done, including that last one where we had three cis women here. So great to have some uh, diverse perspectives, uh, realizing gender is a construct, but still really good to have a mix of voices here. And what we're going to try to do is uh, see if we can uh, empower everybody uh, to uh, participate in this conversation. You can either, you can certainly respond to what you've heard from the three. You can put that into the chat, ask some questions or comments if you want to, remembering that the chat gets captured. So there's value in putting things into the chat because um, then we have it in our notes and we will remember what was raised. Uh, but you can also just, uh, you can also just unmute and, and offer a question or a comment. And then I'm going to suggest that in terms of this visioning piece, we've got about 35 minutes to talk, if we can, tangibly about how 
as much as visioning has tends to sometimes be abstract, we're actually getting at the gist of this. You know, what do you think the specific kinds of things are that we can act, that we have some agency over to actually build more inclusive economies here in Victoria? R realizing that we have people across the country, as you know, this is attended by dozens of others across the country live, and then we'll have many, 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 many more who will watch it subsequently and continue to learn from you and be inspired by what you're talking about. So, um, so practical is good, um, aspirational is fine too. Um, I'm wondering if we might start with identifying what we think the key obstacles are. And I just heard Christina use the magic phrase, Ottawa, too many decisions being made in Ottawa. And I see nodding around here. So let's think a little bit. We have a window here. We have a new federal government. There's a different kind of, we have, a, you know, you, you know that phrase Overton window, you know, you have this period where, where they mm -hmm. don't kind of know what they're doing. They're still trying to figure out where the bathrooms are. And uh, and then you have that moment where you can influence public policy, maybe more so than further into a, a government's life. So are there particular obstacles? Uh, let's start with the easy stuff. The obstacles are the barriers that you think could be removed that would allow us to watch inclusive economies grow more. So I might start with that. And um, we have a number of CUI staff and colleagues and Victoria Foundation staff and Coast Capital. Great to have you here and, and have your uh, sort of endorsement of how central this conversation is and how important it is to engage your sector. So terrific. Um, to, we've got various folks who can help. They can populate the chat. We've got a jam board on the run that uh, Lisa will be able to share with us as it gets more populated. So um, uh, we could perhaps have a look at the jam board and see where it's at. Uh, and then you'll see what to, what Lisa's building so that you know that your comments will not be lost forever. Um, so Lisa, when you're ready to put it up, put it up. Um, I'm gonna start with these obstacles if we could, uh, things that need to be torn down basically. Somebody just say, I think Narendra, you said we've got a topple. We've got to topple. I love that. Let's topple the system. So what are the obstacles first that you would tackle? And let's and anything, the more tangible you can make your comment, the better. Who wants to go first? Go for it. You can always put your little hand up. You know, there's a little thing down here where you can raise your hand, come za, and then you get to lower it as well. Or you can just unmute and speak. And if you don't, I'll start calling on people, which I've been known to do. So uh, has anybody got an idea about an obstacle? Sarah, you're smiling at me, so I'm going to ask you first. Um, give me an obstacle that we can tackle, that we should take down. It's and actually, can you just t tell people where you're, where you're coming in from? Because I don't know if everybody, I don't know you, so tell I, me. I'm not in Victoria. Uh, I'm on Vancouver Island in the northwest of Tassis. When there was a mill here, there was a plane every day to Vancouver, but there's not anymore. Uh -huh. And uh, so that draws you a picture if you want. Yeah. And I feel like that speaks to sort of toppling the power, right? Like, because yep. one of the things that we, as our village, small village, brought to the UBCM this year during like advocacy time was that the government jobs are in Victoria and there's not sort of this like rural lens where like things are extracted from, which is a value because everyone wants to have a, a second home or a vacation or a fishing trip or, you know, like a, a wild place to um, run away to or permanently live in, in my case. Right. So right, right. I guess that's like for tackling power from that point of view, it's like small communities are under resourced mm -hmm. because their resources are mm -hmm. like in, in oftentimes uh, sort of, previously extracted for the wealth of the the rest you know mm -hmm. so that the haves and the have nots but. yeah yeah i mean there someone's asking in the chat could we put a question into the chat so i'm hoping jamie can do that or somebody from the cy staff so sarah one of the things i think you're making a point there is that one power may in fact have been redistributed somewhat during covid because all of a sudden now you're able to work from a smaller community i have several staff here who who work in small communities and maybe they couldn't have done that five years ago, right? So maybe that's a bit of a rebound, do you think? Oh, for sure. Well, that's one of the ways that like, uh, I have just as much room on the tile squares as everyone else, even though I yes, don't have this do. sort of like Tim Hortons within, you know, five minutes of my house or these sorts of hospitals, you know, you have to leave this town to have, uh, you know, any sort of hospital treatment. So yeah. things like transport are not in the rural areas and like having that sort of yeah. Uh, continuous flow of like at one point in time this town expect extracted labor or lumber all around the world right so it's mm -hmm, not just mm -hmm. been extracted to places like victoria or vancouver it's also been ex uh you know japan everywhere in the pacific so i think that that sort of speaks to uh, what's been uh what's built these 
structure. Yeah, right? the history. I mean, you've got, and, and you have that tacit DNA there. You've got a lot of expertise. We have this in Western Canada too, in the Alberta, you know, where they had oil and gas and they have tremendous expertise, but then that is that industry is failing. So where does that expertise go? So as you say, where do you go with the skills that exist in your community? The point you're making though about ubiquitous broadband or more evenly distributed broadband is a very tangible thing that government can do. It can make broadband more available. And interestingly, so many people have moved into communities through COVID. It's going, there's going to be a tremendous pressure on the government to make sure that happens. So that's a that to me is an obstacle or a barrier that we can really advocate for collectively. And it's interestingly, it's not just rural where the service is bad. You know, we have lots of urban neighborhoods where the service is not adequate as well. So it seems to me that's a thing we can all get behind about improving and making equitable ex- access to digital broadband. Thanks for that. Okay, other uh, barriers that people might think that we could take down. We're, ta- we're in the toppling business as per Narendra's directive. Any other things you can see that, would, that could be removed that would allow Victoria to have a more inclusive economy? Suggestion. Jonathan. You weren't kidding about calling people out, eh? I'm afraid that's, I that's wasn't, yeah, it, right? and I don't live here, so I can get away with yeah. it. I'm not going to bump into it. I was loved how Sarah said we don't have a Tim Hortons here. you got to love Canada. Yeah. That's one of the things yeah. we evaluate. Do we have a Tim Hortons in our town? I'm not going to yeah. bump into you in Tim Hortons tomorrow. Go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, well, I think that, uh, you know, I, I appreciate everything that, that Sarah said about, uh, uh, you know, living outside the urban centers and that. I just wanted to say that, so thank you for, for sharing that, because I think that's a key uh, piece, but I think that one of the, the pieces that's really key for me and somebody that uh, that has young kids and just thinking about mm-hmm. uh, families is that child care affordability and availability. I mean, you look at uh, uh, those yeah. costs in the uh, in the vital signs report. I mean, for two kids uh, on average and or the median uh, cost in Greater Victoria is two thousand dollars or close to it. That's a large uh, that's a large amount of money uh, yeah. each month out of people's pockets. And when you look at uh, as uh, as as you were talking about the the who thinks the economy is good as uh, as people with uh, over eighty thousand dollars, I mean then you start going down and it's it's looking at it like well where are my dollars going to and what does that mean when I re-enter the economy and that and uh, in the in the report it also talks about how women were disproportionately affected by the pandemic and a lot of that falls on childcare as well so I think that that's something else that's really key within our. Uh, region and within our society to look at is uh, is those child care questions and uh, how we have enough available spaces and affordable spaces so that uh, uh, that doesn't uh, have a have a backup so that we can create a balancing effect uh, within the workforce and uh, and that as well because taking care of children uh, as mm-hmm. uh, as Mayor Helps was saying it's there's there's gendered roles that haven't quite uh, figured mm-hmm. their way out yet and I think that there's a lot of uh, people that are um, that a lot of families that have more equitable pieces in terms of the partnership, I think that's mm-hmm. still something that uh, there are those gender roles and that does have an impact on, on women. So I think that's a yeah. piece that I would just point out as we, as we go forward to keep going. So we've got a question about rural and distrib- more inclusive to involve more rural folks who don't have access to the kinds of services, whether it's healthcare, which is an important point that Sarah mentioned, but also internet and broadband. And then Jonathan, you're just adding a childcare. Now we do have a federal government that made a big fat commitment to a lot of childcare spaces, support and spaces. So one of the themes that's also rolled through the last couple of days is accountability. So it's incumbent on us to hold that government accountable for the promise they made and which a number of provinces have agreed to, to as you suggest, to make that investment in child care, uh, which is essential to the productivity of every economic region across the country. Uh, as you say, it's gendered, but it's also that if you have a person who wants to participate in the workforce prevented from contributing because they can't afford the child care, there's no, or there is no child care to even take advantage of, you're uh, in not only inhibiting their own capacity to contribute, you're inhibiting the economy as a whole. So it's a very important argument, uh, um, point to raise. Thanks, Jonathan. They'll get it on the Jamboard for sure. Erica and then Mark. Hi, thank you so much for taking uh, my opportunity to, I'm, I'm really interested in all the pieces that have been brought up and I want to bring attention to one of the seeking uh, equity groups, which is uh, people with disabilities. And I really appreciated when Navinder, when you mentioned when we compare what is considered um, a minimum income when CERB was created, and we see the level of, P- uh, of PWD benefits, right? So that tells us how we're uh, looking at people. And I would say that one of the p- big obstacles that we see is if we explore the essence is the mindset of ableism and what we consider to be kind of 
the, the normal, the expected, and all assumptions that come with ableism. And so that is something that I think we all need to explore to really look at how we create more inclusive uh, communities. Now, when, um, when you were mentioning about childcare right now, it is the part um, when we see the access to childcare and to an inclusive childcare, I want to mention like a person, a family raising a child with a disability, um, they might not have access to those spaces because the extra support needed. That it's not available. Uh, it's not readily re available in any in every childcare. So I think recognizing the needs of those most are the margins is also really important. And there's a large group of families raising uh, children or family members with a disability who are not able to access the economy exactly because of the barriers or the lack of supports and resources needed to support their family members. So yeah, I wanted to bring that that one up. Thank you. Thanks, Erica. And I saw your point in the chat too about that, about disabilities and accessibility. It did come up in a session just we just finished um, with young people, made the same, a similar kind of point around accessibility and disabilities. Um, and I appreciate going into the chat as well so that it gets recorded and we'll, we will absolutely be cognizant of that as we go forward. Okay, Mark, let's hear it. Hi. Thanks, thanks Mary. Thanks all. Am I coming through? I've been having some audio issues You're today. You're good. You're, okay, you're good. coming through crystal clear. We can't hear you. Can't, we, need, we all need to wear that T-shirt nowadays, right? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, thanks for convening this to the foundation and uh, uh, appreciate it, uh, Coast Capital as well. Uh, apologies for missing the beginning, so I might be redundant here, but I think some of the barriers that are really obvious nowadays are, first of all, uh, the heightened thankfully the heightened awareness of indigenous reconciliation. And I think uh, the fact that nationally, we're still looking at issues of water quality on, on reserves, um, you know, until we get rid of that blight organ as a nation, it's gonna be very difficult for us to engage in, in, a, in some sort of inclusivity. Uh, and I think we need to recognize that. I think um, the, uh, the minister Ravi Kalun came to the chamber event yesterday and uh, I talked about this a little bit, and I think it's very important, is a recognition of uh, interprovincial and also international credentials between people. Um, it's a real issue, I think, for, for people. And it's, it's crazy that, uh, you know, my sister-in-law, who is a, is a massage therapist in Alberta, would need to completely recredential -creden -re to come here, or dentists and doctors who, uh, you know, from family member, extended family members of, of mine in India, would mm -hmm. not be able to come here and practice here. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there's a lot of weight being held by those uh, provincial boards. And I understand we're provincial uh, systems in that way, but I think there needs to be something done. Uh, what would a, that, Mark, what would that look like? I mean, this notion of what used to be called foreign credentials um, has been around for a long time. We've got all sorts of folks. We Everybody has an anecdote about this, about some physician that's driving a cab or whatever it is. And what is the, what do you think the obstacle is from your perspective in terms of why haven't we been able to crack that nut? Is it a jurisdictional fight between the feds and the provinces? Is it consumers being fearful? What do you think it is? What's the obstacle? I mean, I hear the, I, I, I hear I, the barrier. Yeah. Sure. How can we solve it? Yeah, yeah, no, I appreciate that. I really appreciate that. It's easier to be a critic than a creator. Um, and so in thinking of a creating the solution here, I'm going to, I mean, Mary Helps did a great session for our program a couple of years ago where she talked about community consultation. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that resonated over and over again is you ask, 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 listen, 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 ask more, ask more, listen, listen, listen. And I agree with that. Completely, like I really do agree with that, but I, I think there's an element here of someone, there, there just needs to be political will somewhere. Someone needs to say, I'm going to take on a responsibility that's not necessarily my responsibility. I'm just going to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to say, I'm going to do this task. And uh, they're going to convene people together and those people are going to gather and they're going to gather because no one is going to ask, why shouldn't we gather? I guess this person probably has an authority and we should gather us together. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to convene and then the conversation is going to happen. And then people are going to start to ask, okay, well, what, what could we do? What could we do? What could we do? Not what can't we do, what shouldn't we do. But I think both do. you and Jonathan are talking about the same thing, though. You've got people who are in a workforce who are being inhibited from, who want to be in a workforce, yeah. have a lot to contribute, who are being inhibited, either because they don't have access to a service or childcare, or they can't get their credential recognized. So I think, you know, as we get older in Canada, I wonder if there will be more pressure on governments at all levels to figure this out, to figure out how do we get more people into the workforce, because we need them. 
to the end of the workforce. And I'm wondering if that will drive it. The discussion you're talking about having is primarily with provinces um, that have the accreditation uh, jurisdiction about whether you can be a nurse or whether you can be a social worker or whether you can, right? So uh, this is an interesting uh, thing to add to the list of where we need a provincial, we need provincial governments to understand that the productivity of their economy is at risk if they don't find ways to get qualified people in participating as best they can, as quickly as they can. Yeah, I, have I got it? Okay. Okay. Anybody have some other obstacles they want to throw in that we can take down? Because then I want to go to opportunities. Every business is a social business. Um, Christina, I'm, I'm rounding up to you, but I want to get a sense of any other obstacles that you guys can see. Any simple stuff? Yeah. Tanya's Mary? got a simple one. Yeah, Tanya's well, got a simple one, have you? It's for it. <laughs> not simple at all, actually. Oh, darn. Um, okay. What I would uh, suggest, just to add a, a different tangent to this conversation, is the lack of uh, true data, Canadian yeah. data. And yeah. uh, that leads to vital signs. It leads to the work that Narinder's working on, all of the investment that needs to happen to get true Canadian data to help drive decisions. Yeah, I, I hope my colleagues from uh, CUI are listening because we're working on a big data submission right now and making that point exactly that you're suggesting that it's kind of inexcusable that we don't actually know what we don't know. And the, we, the question kind of becomes, where, should we, where do we try to fix that first? So should we be trying to get local data organized? That would be my argument. Like, let's find ways to get resources so that we actually know what's going on in local communities. Then we can stitch together more local communities with other communities, and then we take it up from there. So let's get some real data and let's get, let's find a way to cut through all the, I don't know if I can say in polite company, all the bullshit that uh, people telling us, no, 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 we can't count this or no, 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 that's proprietary. It's got to become, as somebody said in one of the in one of the meetings, you know, during COVID, we found a way to do all sorts of things that had been too difficult. So surely to goodness coming out of COVID, we're going to recognize that we need better local data. So thank you, Tanya. Let's see if we can make that happen. Make data a priority. Okay, Christina, your hand is up. Yeah, oh, hi, you. thank you so much. And this is a really critical conversation. So I appreciate, appreciate everyone's comment. Um, I wanted to just reflect on the culture that kind of underlines some of the decisions that are made. And as Lisa said in the chat, I've been part of the social procurement initiative and presenting to a lot of procurement staff and, and um, councils, as well as, um, you know, with the recent launch of our impact investment fund, talking to investors. And there's a very strong culture, you know, I'd say in the procurement side that we're, we're driving to lowest price and we're can, trying to change the culture and the narrative away from lowest price to greatest value. And on the investor side, I hear the conversations around highest financial return on investment. So we have these pressures around, um, around how those systems structured and work. And I think we need to begin to tell and really loudly tell a new story and allow space for a different kind of conversations so that those systems have an opportunity to change. So I was just thinking about the power of storytelling and being able to get to the culture that's kind of underneath some of the spaces that I see are barriers and also opportunities for inclusive economies. Yeah, getting stories told is important because we have examples and you actually have quite a few in Victoria. You probably just take them for granted because you know them so well. But there are lots of parts of the country that do not know what a circular economy is, don't actually understand what the indigenizing of an economy would look like. And uh, I appreciate what you're suggesting, that there are ways to tell these stories that will then inspire and inform other folks. OK, other obstacles. I guess we need to we need to figure out, Christina, what are the obstacles to telling stories? And some of it probably is, um, do we have the right channels? You know, media has become fractured, all that kind of thing. So there are some specific things. Maybe other people will comment on that about how do we get those? What are the obstacles getting those stories told? Any other obstacles people want to raise? Because I know you're just chomping at the bit to go to opportunities. OK, opportunities. Now, Christina, Christina Clark, let's talk about how how practically and someone's asked you in the chat, how practically can we get every so every business to see themselves as a social business? Go for it. Well, I, one of the things, well, we have some, some like, have you ever heard of B Corps? Mm -hmm. so sure. it, there is some practices where pe companies that, you know, we always talk about good corporate culture and being a good corporate citizen. We need to take that thinking uh, much further. I heard the other day that we used to ask government to protect us from big business, and now we're asking big business to protect us from government. And I think that, that yeah, uh, both of them are wrong. <laughs> the um, 
we need to be empowered locally. I mean, ultimately, we we we're the spenders. Mm -hmm. Um, we create the economy by how we spend our money. So Mm -hmm. we need to be intentional, as was said earlier, about every dollar we spend, what paradigm are we contributing to? Mm -hmm. And we're the investors too, right? I mean, all the public dollars are our dollars and all the pensions are our money. And we have, I think you're right, we have many different ways in which we could actually see that. Uh, And I think the point that uh, that others are trying to make is that it's actually, you know, the, the purpose of business initially if you think way, way back, businesses were about, I need this to thrive. What do you need to thrive? How do we trade with each other so we each mutually thrive? That's the history of small business is just engaging in trading. So it's not as if this is totally foreign to people to start thinking this way, that uh, there's a social purpose to my the way I run my professional life, my business life, and the way I spend my money. Other other opportunities that people say, I see that Laurie has put a point in the chat. One of my colleagues pointed this out. Laurie, you, you were saying trust is a big obstacle to sharing stories. Tell me what you're what you mean there. And do you I want to talk a little bit talking, more about that? Yeah. Yeah, I think when we're talking about toppling um the current, you know, systems, yeah. I think that there's been a lot of talk around media and do we trust our media outlets and, and where are we getting our information from? And how do you trust that what you're reading is is really what's happening in the world? And I think that that goes back to um you know, to being transparent and, and, and knowing where to go to for really good quality information that you can trust, like, where are people finding out their information? And I think that that is, um, you know, yeah, there's a sc- off of Facebook and yeah, and- there's a scary answer to that, isn't there? But um, no, as you is. say, which is eroding trust, but, but I also wonder, I mean, I'm interested if others would comment with where Lori's coming from. I know people want to demonize Facebook as it's, you know, it's been popularizing misinformation, but I actually get lots of really good local information from my Facebook feeds. I actually hear about my neighbors on Facebook, so th- there can be a good side, I think, but any other thoughts from you, Lori, in terms of how we could build more trust? How could we foster trust? I think, again, it's just talking. It's just convening conversations. It's it's mm-hmm. coming together. It's sharing, um, I don't know, just sharing good resources and, and just knowing where, where you can go for those good resources. I just think that there isn't enough quality information out there that people can use to make decisions, to connect with the right people. I think that there's mm-hmm. just a huge gap there. People are so streamed in their own channels that they're not able to listen to what's mm-hmm. happening, right? We're all just micro streamed and that's an issue as well. Yeah. How do we get out of that? I mean, off, you know, sometimes public space can do that because you bump into somebody who's not like you. Uh, but as you say, it gets, your world gets too small. And during COVID, my gosh, our world's got very small, didn't they? Because we weren't going on well. You're echoing comments, uh, Tanya's comment about data. She wants good mm-hmm. data. Um, and I think that that, it's interesting to see the strength of this vital science report and how, Sandra, I'm sure you would say this, that you're seen as a trusted data source, I bet. Uh, you know, you're seen differently. The foundation would be seen as a different kind of source than the newspaper or uh, or other kinds of uh, vehicles. So that's an interesting thing to create more of these kinds of neutral shared vehicles. Okay, any other opportunities that people want to highlight? And the, the time we've got left, I think what would be useful maybe would be to go to some key actions. The mayor's really been focused on getting every session to focus on some tangible actions. So are there actions that you could imagine you could commit to that your household could commit to, that your organization could commit to, that your business could commit to, or that you think somebody else should commit to, um, to actually strengthen uh, the potential for an inclusive economy here. Actions. Sarah, I'm coming back to you. Got an action? Uh, I don't know. I guess there's a lot of little actions, right? Yeah, little actions are good. Yeah, like the the way that, um, you know, um in insurance is collected so that it can like sort of be funneled into things that we need like we need insurance for like fire departments and stuff like yeah. that like that's sort of about participatory budgeting in that sense yeah like I, I think too that like I don't know our actions are really like uh small in the sense that it's like hens and it's like like trying to figure out exactly what it is that we need so that we can fulfill Mm. that need in ourselves Mm. and and Mm. I mean 
more yeah. intentional, more intentional about what it is we need. Okay. Yeah. Like picking like your, you know, things that you're going to like go to bat for, like what you want to set yep. your life around. Right. Which is, yep. is sort of like this sort of leisure centered life instead of like sort of a like career centered life where you sort of like put the, the cart before the horse. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. Are you looking at me? Just, just, just asking, just checking. <laughs> Melody, <laughs> Melody, can you give me, can you give us a tangible action? that you might think would be useful for people to focus on. I haven't heard from you yet, so I'm calling on you. But I can't hear you. Can anybody else hear? Is it just me? This happens that sometimes everybody else can hear. Oh, what people will do to not have to answer my question. It's really amazing. You could put something into the chat, Melody. Maybe that would work. Tracy, are you there? Have you got a tangible action you might suggest? Oops, there. Hi. Uh, yeah, so yeah, you're. Um, I mean, I think so. I work at the Victoria Foundation and, and work specifically with their granting department. And I, I think one thing that we could be doing is supporting more organizations to apply for funding. Oh, great. Um, with livable wages. Mm-hmm. So um, I know we're doing a lot of work with the nonprofit sector around diversification of funding and different funding models. Um, but working specifically to listen to the needs of the nonprofit sector and what they would need to be able to run the organizations well and to retain staff and um, to, to prevent burnout. So I think supporting the nonprofits through yeah. uh, inclusive granting models. Yeah, well, and I know, again, you know, your foundation, as others across the country, did a bunch of emergency responses during COVID. Sandra, Sandy and I talked about that when I first landed earlier this week. Um, and the question, again, is, as you say, are there other opportunities where we're going to need community um, uh, resources allocated to just help people through, uh, as you suggest, it's a good idea. What about our three panelists? I'm wondering if I could put them on the spot with any suggestions they have for tangible actions that we can all leave from leave this session with. So I'm going to go first to you, Ruth. Um, is there something tangible, one or two things that you think that would be tangible actions that we should focus on? Over to you first. I, I think we've heard it from everyone and it's typically my own uh, preferred way of going at this as well. The answer is in the hands of community. Mm-hmm. The answers are in the hands of community. Mm-hmm. Um, and when we start to look, that's the first place for us to, to, to start. Um, having tables such as this, vital conversations such as this you know i was looking through uh really quickly earlier and looking at the snapshot on 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 racism um some of the anti-racism work that the uh local intercultural uh the ica is doing Mm -hmm. and again uh to to narita narinda's point it's about the question of you know even when you start to further disaggregate what stories are contained uh, within the numbers and the figures that we see, uh, but also uh, speaking to, yes, we need to collect the data, but then our sense of what is data, uh, data is not just uh, the quantitative qualifiers that we have. It goes into the stories. It goes into the less tangible things as well. So even as we're engaging communities, uh, we've got to ensure that we're being inclusive um, in in how we're approaching, in how we're presenting, and ensuring that we're really able to do the work with them uh, to 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 uh, foster the change that we need. Mm-hmm. Yes. Look to community. Thanks, Ruth. Narinder. So I, I'll touch on disaggregated data and the data part. I think there's a number of organizations and individuals here that deploy capital, including the city, Bank Victoria Foundation, um, Coast Capital and others. And so how can you take a leadership role in sharing and collecting that disaggregated data and making that more accessible um, so that we can, again, if we want to shift power, shift who gets access to resources, we're not going to be able to do that without knowing our current baseline. So I think we all can commit to um, being public about the the demographic uh, data uh, distribution of who's on our board, who's in our leadership, and who gets the capital that we're deploying. And that's going to start to bring in some much needed transparency so we can start to action um, more equitable processes. Yeah, and Ruth put into the chat that the BC government's actually starting to devolve this and put resources in the hands of communities, eh, Ruth, so they can actually do their own data collection and collect their own data. Yes. It, because the problem often is whoever collects the data, it it 
can have a particular bent to it, right? Depending on who did the collection. And then it, and then they don't release it sometimes. And so they know, and this happened during COVID all the time. Communities could not find out where the outbreaks were and only the province knew, yeah. Mm -hmm. Christina, last word to you in terms of a particular kind of action that you might advocate for people to start thinking about taking. Well, look, there you go. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Which Christina are you talking yes, about? Yes, yeah, actually I was about to I was about to unmute myself and say Clark. <laughs> a concrete action that we can take. Um, I mean, we've talked about so many different actions underway already. And I think that that making ourselves, if each one of us continues to do what we're doing here today, which is making ourselves better informed mm -hmm. about what's happening right now, uh, so that we're prepared to, um, this is evolving in real time, it's moving mm -hmm. really quickly. So having conversations like these is a concrete action that yeah. we need to continue to do. We need to sort of build up momentum on the thought leadership side. And mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about radically shifting the way our, our, our economy works and, and potentially with planet-wide implications. And, and here we are, you know, in a little town thinking of doing that, but it's, it's real and that's how change actually happens. So uh, I just, I believe that these things do happen with us in the front lines and um, we're leading individually. Uh, Canadians are leading this change and uh, I hope government will catch up with where we're at. So we're, we're moving really quickly. Yeah, people always need to be reminded of that, don't they, Christina? The governments don't lead, they actually follow. And, uh, and I agree with you that you're showing extraordinary leadership here in this community and in these in communities within communities. Laurie, uh, Lisa uh, Mort Putland puts in the uh, chat an interesting piece about BIPOC and LGBTQQQ++ plus plus, uh, that those it's a community I'm part of so I can uh, have trouble with the acronym. Um, but also as you suggest has to be inclusive of disabilities and other kinds of diversities uh, and how those conversations can start helping organize a narrative that then can be broadened and grow uh, to take us into that direction. So. Uh, I just want to take the chance to, on behalf of Coast Capital and the Victoria Foundation and the, the City of Vancouver, sorry, City of Victoria, and me, this Canadian Urban Institute, who we work for it with, um, thanks very much for being part of this conversation. Uh, the, inclusive, the inclusive economy conversation is a critical one uh, that exists in every community in this country. And <laughs> it, we, we're not there yet. Uh, obviously, as you say, we've got some positive things happening, but lots and lots of struggle and a really critical moment in front of us here as we recover from COVID. Um, and there's tons of government changes, you know, you know, there were just changes at municipal levels in Alberta, there will be provincial elections next year, there will be other municipal elections, the federal government is just, uh, uh, you know, taking a new turn. So this is our moment, folks, to build, uh, build our communities from the ground up. So thanks so much for being part of it. And thanks for contributing to we watch the uh, we'll send out notes for you, you'll be able to see this is captured and all the important things that you've raised will be uh, captured and the Jamboard lives on. The link is in the chat. You can see what uh, folks have been posting up there. And uh, really great to have you part of this conversation. And we have one more, uh, which is happening in, I think, an hour and a half um, about um, uh, belonging and welcoming. So we hope if you're still with us, we hope that we'll be join us uh, in an hour and a half for the last session of CUI Victoria. Thanks, everybody. Great to be with you. Uh, and thanks, Mayor Helps, for the initial uh, facilitation and for the three panelists that joined us. Thanks, everybody. Oh, I'm passing to Carol. Carol, I'm passing to you. Go, Carol. Great. I think you've wrapped us up well, Mary. Um, just we'll echo that to thank Mayor Helps and uh, Narinda, or, uh, Ruth and uh, Christina for being panelists and just everyone who participated. I think of Ruth saying, you know, the answers in the hands of the community. And um, it, it's so clear that conversations like this can really lead to solutions and we're on our way. Um, so I want to take a moment, though, to give a special thanks to Coast Capital and for partnering with us on vital conversations like this and to Tanya and Maureen and the whole social purpose team. So it's just um, great and so important to bring vital signs to life and, and uh, look at how we can um, move from the data that we talked about today to actual actions and solutions. So um, Mary, did you mention the next session coming up? You know, there's it's in the okay. chat. It's called okay. welcoming city strategy. Okay. It's in the chat. Yeah. 
So yeah, I hope everyone will join us at 5 p.m. if you can for the Welcoming City Task Force. And that will be our last session of three great days with CUIX. So thanks everyone for coming. And on behalf of our board and staff, um, yeah, it's been great to be part of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you to the Victoria Foundation for your partnership. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Diana.